Hello, people. I finished the book. Two days it took me to finish this. A Plague of Insurrection. And they call it a Plague of Insurrection because a lot of the information out of this book uh, comes from an account that a monk wrote. And uh, he was not... He was not favorable to the to the rebels, uh, and he you know he compared what they were doing to to a, to being crazy, to being mentally ill. Uh, like most of the church people, the book was only a hundred and fifty two pages, so that's kind of why I finished it so quickly. Not only was it only 152 pages, but there was a shit ton of notes in the back. And it had like five pages of notes after every chapter. And and those pages of notes were numbered, you know. So, so I didn't read them. A lot of them weren't even in English. So I didn't really read those. It took me not even two full days. 152 pages, published in 1993. Uh, the guy that wrote this... Uh, he uh, he's like a, a history professor and it read a little bit like, like a textbook it really did I bought this this was the book that I left on a shelf and I went back to get I only went back and bought two books and I bought this because I thought it was going to give me another account of the battle of the golden spurs but I was about 20 years, I miscalculated by about 20 years. This book was very, very, and I, and I like this, you know, uh, I like it when something is narrowly focused. Uh, the, uh, the subtitle is Popular Politics and Peasant Revolt in Flanders, 1323 to 1328. And the Battle of the Golden Spurs was like 20 years previously, the same area, they, you know, this this Courtray, uh, that figures into this book too, and and actually, like when the when the nobs when the nobles and the nobility put down the revolt, and when they had their revenge, uh, a lot of that, you know, not only were they having revenge for this revolt. But they, they still had in the back of their heads the, the humiliating defeat that they had uh, at Courtrai. Uh, second paragraph, page 85. Okay, this starts out with a guy, Count Lewis. And Count Lewis was really, he was put in charge of Flanders. Really, he was only in charge for a couple of months, and the revolt starts. He didn't have a good time. Uh, and there, he, he's caught in the open, and, and the peasant armies were, were quite organized. They, they, uh, they're threatening Count Louis and his, his men. He's only got like 400 men. So Count Louis retreats to the city, uh, actually Courtrai, and he decides to to burn down the suburbs of the city so that he can see better, he can see if there's a peasant army approaching. He doesn't really tell the, the citizens of, of Courtrai what he's going to do, and the fire ends up being bigger than, than it was supposed to be. So, so the citizens, they, they're, they're not too happy with... Count Louis. Uh, Count Louis and his force were caught between the raging fire and the angry people of Courtrai, who, responding to the clamor and the ringing of church bells, turned out in great numbers to attack Louis's force. As the mounted warriors attempted to flee, objects thrown from windows of houses hindered their escape, while men and women alike began literally to cut them to pieces with whatever weapons they had at hand. When the battle was over, the Count's force had suffered he heavy casualties. Among those killed, both during the hostilities and while being held prisoner, were some of the most prominent knights and nobles in Louis' retinue. And then they go on to, to name a whole bunch of these people. 
and I'm not going to bother with that. Um, we'll skip that. Count Louis's great uncle, John of Namur, Namur, escaped during the melee with only light wounds and found temporary asylum in the monastery of St. Martin at Tournay, about 25 kilometers south of Courtrai along the Scheldt River. The Count himself was captured and turned over to the militia of the city of Bruges, which transported him back to Bruges for more than five months of detention. They end up letting him go. They shouldn't. Uh, and I have written here, anti-church. Not only were these peasants uh, against the nobility and against the tax collectors, but they also ended up being against uh, anti-clerical, because really the the uh, you know the tithing and all that shit was just another drain on their already meager resources. Second paragraph, page one twenty. Okay, and this is near the end. The, uh, the the thing ends with a big battle at Castle. C A S S E L. And it's kind of a, a crushing defeat for for the the peasants. Uh, though the three armies deployed in this fashion doubtless contained city folks in their ranks. There is no clear evidence that any of the large cities played an official role in trying to stop the invasion of the French king and his allies. Always suspicious of the intentions of the conservatives in control of Ghent, the magistrates of Bruges, headed by William D. Deccan, kept that city's militia at home in a state of readiness, though they did send a contingent of 100 archers to aid the rebels at Castle. So that's why I... I picked out that paragraph. That is the only place in this book where he gives me any kind of idea of what types of weaponry either side is using. In another spot, he does talk about uh, the knights being in armor. And uh, so I know that they're wearing armor, but are they fighting with just swords, just lances? What the hell is going on here? I I can handle those kinds of... of uh, details, especially when the entire book is focused in on five years. You can give me that. Uh, the Battle of Castle, the, the, the peasants end up losing. They, uh, they know that they're being invaded by, it's about 4,000 knights. And not all these knights are French, you know. Some of them come from other areas because they don't like the idea of a peasant revolt being successful. So, the peasants split their forces into three different armies because they don't know which way this invasion is going to come. Which, I don't know, it was not a great idea because they're 60 miles apart. There's no way they could come to the aid of each other. And so when this army gets gets crushed, that's it. The, 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 the revolt kind of falls apart. Not many of these people get away either. Second paragraph of, of 132. The tragedy of the Flemish peasant revolt is that it actually was doomed by its own success. It came to an end not because of any internal weakness within the movement itself, for it was able to hold its own against all domestic opponents and even create a degree of normalcy within the rebel districts of Flanders. Rather, its fate was sealed when it provoked an international crusade replete with full ecclesiastical sanctions. Because it had significantly extended the realm of the possible for peasant political activity, it caught the attention of rulers throughout northwestern Europe, who moved jointly to crush this challenge to traditional authority before it spread any further. Only massive force applied from the outside ended this bold and apparently unique experiment. The, the author never goes into the atrocities committed by both sides, which is a shame because I like to read that. Uh, like I said, it was kind of a textbook type of thing, but a very unique book. I mean, where the fuck are you going to find this, you know? Where? And it goes right along with 
a lot of what I have been reading about the uh, the 14th and the 15th century. There's just a lot written about France, and especially northwestern France. Thanks for watching.